Hello and welcome to another edition of Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham, where Team Needham discusses everything healthcare. I'm your host, Sean Needham, along with my wonderful wife, Janet, and we are super excited to be streaming from the Moses Lake Professional Pharmacy Podcast Studio, and even more excited to have a special guest on today, um, Carl Lambert, who might hold the record of being on our podcast the most times. Not sure, but he's been on a handful of times. We're super excited to have him on today, back on. And basically, the topic is today is ask us anything. Um, so if anybody has any comments or questions about um, HRT is both of our specialties and um, or COVID, Carl is, uh, has a lot of information about COVID, diet, exercise, sleep, general health, please uh, comment on our Facebook. We stream on uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, X now, which I, I finally said that without saying Twitter. <laughs> And um, what am I missing? Uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, Spotify. Twitter. No, well, we don't stream, we stream oh, live on Spotify. We don't stream live. Okay. But our podcast is, great point, Janet, our podcast is available on Spotify or any of your favorite podcast forums. So please go there and subscribe to our podcast and like, share, and all that good stuff. So um, Carl, welcome to our show. Hey, thank you. Good afternoon. Yes. So... Um, tell us a little bit about your history, Carl. We've been working with you for 20 plus years, I believe. I lose track after you get to be 50 years old. The, the years just go by <laughs> faster than the days. So um, tell us a little bit about your history and um, working with us. Yeah, you know, it's, you're right. It's been it's probably 20 plus years. Is it 23? I don't know. It's been been a long time. So, uh, no, it's been a great uh, professional friendship experience uh, over all these years. Wait a minute. You think we're friends? <laughs> oh, that's, that's true. Let's just keep it professional. There we go. Okay. Oh, no, no. <laughs> you, you know, we both have a sense of humor. So, <laughs> yeah, yes. No, you know, it's, you know, think about all the conferences we run into each other and, yeah. and some, of the, some of the things we learn and some of the lamenting that we've done over how we used to practice, um, you know, in terms of big pharma and some of the medications. And, and you know, the good news is, we grieve, we go through it, and we go, hey, let's keep moving on to uh, 21st century medicine. Yeah, it's interesting because Janet and I were having that discussion last night, and and Janet just kicked herself. And I won't get go down the rabbit hole of, of what it was, but, um, you know, she says, I just wish we wouldn't have done that. 20 some years ago. I wish we wouldn't have done that. And, you know, it was all medical related and we were just drinking the Kool-Aid, the big pharma Kool-Aid about how good it was for our family. And we just wish we wouldn't have done it. Yeah. You know, it's, I think of it as, uh, I mean, think about how <laughs> we parent, we could, we could uh, sit in shame and go, Oh, if only I'd done this better, but yeah. you know, what, what good does that do for us? Right. We just have to go, right. okay, learn from it. Let's, let's keep moving on. Keep moving well, forward. and one thing I look at it too is, and I was telling Janet, the, the positive side of it is it gives us an opportunity to educate and empower mm -hmm. individuals um, to make their own healthcare choices. And, um, that's what we've done is we've learned from it and we educate other people because of it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's very exciting. So let's start with some, I'm going to start it with a general question. Um, so how is, you know, we both specialize in HRT. We love HRT because it's, it, it does so many great things for our patients. Um, mm -hmm. HRT was functional medicine before there was functional medicine. Um, it you know prevents many kinds of diseases and helps people feel better. So that being said, has your your practice of HRT changed any way pre COVID and post COVID? Well, you know the, the you still have to kind of um, go back to the solid objective data of thousands upon thousands upon thousands and and the myriad of research so you can't deviate from that because you have to look at that objective data and so how have i changed um i would say i still take all that data and i still practice the way i've been practicing but the there's um probably nuances and tweaks and changes and adjustments i've had to make in this post covid era and that comes down to, you know, whether it's vaccinated injury, shed upon, um, microclotting, you know, all these things that have suddenly made pathophysiology so much more complex than it used to be. And it's like, normally, 
what I've seen, you know, historically, it's like, oh, people respond to this and uh, away we go and don't have any issues. But this post-COVID world has been more challenging. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, have you seen HRT actually help your patients recover from COVID long term? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, you know, again, oh, uh, there's one case, um, 25 year old uh, young man, young man, uh, severely vaccine injured. Um, he'd been seeing all the specialists uh, over on the west side, UW long COVID clinic, uh, and just finally got fed up and, and came over and saw me and, and, you know, to their credit, uh, to a lot of the specialists over there in the University of Washington, they did a whole plethora of lab testing. Uh, but I know from just my experience that, for example, the spiked protein likes to attack the testicles in men. And so the one test they had not checked on this young man who had lost 40 pounds, was no longer working, living with his parents, um, really miserable, uh, you know, brain fog, no energy. So I checked his testosterone levels, and I don't think I've seen levels this low in a 25-year-old man, but he was something like 170 total oh, testosterone. In a 25-year-old mm. man, it should be 10 times that. should be 10 times that. So, you know, we keep honed in on that, started treating him for that as well, some other issues, and he's gaining weight. He's mm. back playing basketball, feeling better, and hopefully – We'll be able to kind of get back up into the workforce and and be living again. So, wow, I'm sure you have lots of stories like that too. Yeah, that's yeah, that's just one of many. It's uh, you know, honestly, you guys, it's overwhelming, and I wish there were more of us clinicians that would open our eyes that this really is an issue uh, that's that's happening, and it's happening to our young people. I mean, age 15 to 44 year olds. Uh, I saw. Mm-hmm. 10-year-old getting Bell's palsy, a 14-year-old young lady with Bell's palsy just in the last month. Uh, you know, Bell's palsy is something that uh, uh, impacts the facial nerve and causes paralysis. And we see that in, what, 50, 60, and 70-year-olds, not in 10- and 14-year-olds. So, yeah. Well, it, it's kind of like myocarditis. I mean, we used to never see myocarditis in young children or hardly ever at all, but especially not young children. Right, right. Yeah, so it's it's taken the immune system and has just flipped it for almost all of us. I mean, we're all impacted in one way or the other. Uh, and so it really, that's it's made, uh, it's made uh, practicing that much more complex, that much more challenging. Janet, what questions do you have for Carl? Well, I think we uh, may have already talked about it, and I'm not sure if you threw this out there, but we have a patient that we share that um, was injured from shedding, we believe, and ended up mm-hmm. having a stroke. Um, and how have you seen... A, a bilateral stroke. Right. Well, yeah, how, have you seen, how have you seen that that play out as far as being able to balance her hormones and getting her on a, a trajectory of health? Because, I mean, she was a very healthy individual before this all happened. Right. Yeah. Very, very healthy. And, you know, we don't have to mention the name, but uh, this person is in the same trade of so, you know, hairdressers um, are constantly exposed mm-hmm. to folks that are, have been double, triple, quadruple vaccinated and the shedding that happens. And that's really, uh, you know, in her case is an example of she got shed upon. And I've seen that in other hairdressers. And so treating these folks um, has more nuances and complexities because, yes, you still have the issue of the low thyroid or the low progesterone or the lack of estrogen or testosterone. But then you have to think about the pathophysiology of where this uh, spike protein impacts the various organs. And thyroid happens to be another major organ. So then you can't only be treating them with optimizing the thyroid, you have to also be thinking about well, what are things that will bind with that spike protein and help it to dissipate and go away. So then it's like, oh, okay, now suddenly the thyroid product that we're using, it's working. And and, and in this case, this gal is doing great. And, and I think we, it took, and, and here's the other thing, you guys, is it's not 
taking weeks. It's taking months. And mm-hmm. I think in her case, we're almost up to a year. Yeah, we're over a year now for her. Over a year, yeah. yeah. And so that's uh, that's been the, the other challenge. And, and, and think about it from the patient's perspective, how discouraging, how disheartening, mm-hmm. depressing in some cases, because... Uh, in her case, uh, her livelihood of, of riding bikes and doing all the things that she was doing as a robust, healthy uh, woman, all those were just taken from her because of her, you know, her role as a hairdresser and taking care of these folks that have uh, been shedding upon her. Although I will say this, um, she is proud to report that she's had her first bike ride since her her stroke, and it went wonderful. So. That is such optimism, um, mm-hmm. such good news. Also, she just messaged me just before this podcast. She was going to um, sit in a comment live, but she was going to be driving. So she said that for the first time in her many years, her blood pressure is normal. She doesn't know that why, if it's because of the increased dose of estrogen or increased dose of thyroid, because those are two things that just mm-hmm. happened. But her blood pressure is doing better than ever, which is just Great news! Oh, that is that is yeah. Well, I love hearing that report. I really do because I, um, yeah. It's uh, as the nurse practitioner, as the clinician providing care, uh, I'll tell you, it's it's um, probably been some of the hardest years because of uh, the number of tears, uh, the depression I've okay. seen from this, and and just the lack of progress. But the, the good news, I mean, hers is a great example of. I do see hope for folks and I do see, you know, people getting better. I mean, even this young man from the Issaquah area, um, when he came with his family, it was like, he was a dark gloomy kind of cloud over the room because, you know, they'd already, you know, who are you to think you're going to you know get us better, but we've heard that maybe things will improve, but for him to get better, they're just like, okay, got to keep going, keep going, got to train more folks to, to step out of the the sick world that they're in, the sickness model, and do what we're doing because there really is hope. But uh, I'll tell you, Sean and Janet, there needs to be more of us. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. Although um, you know as well as I do that with the way our healthcare system works and is backed so much by big pharma, mm-hmm. um, you know the chances of you know, a majority of the healthcare professionals turning away from that anytime soon is just, you know, the chance is very small. So, um, you know, we have to yeah, do our best. Well, yeah. Well, and this is where, you know, I think I shared with you the statistic of, uh, let's see, in 21, uh, Peter McCullough, Dr. McCullough was saying it was about um, 6% of us clinicians nationwide were treating an entire nation. So that right. represents... Point zero 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 three seven five percent, some something minuscule, right? And so, at the last Freedom Conference that we we hosted, uh, I think it was Dr. Uh, Bowden who said it's up to three percent. So, you yeah, know, that's ex- that's exponential growth. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that is that is right. So, um, well, I, I know you probably feel the same way I do, but one of the things that um, I I love what we do because it is so rewarding. Um, we get, you know, comments from patients almost daily saying how we've changed their life, saved their life, saved their marriage. And that is just super rewarding. And I can tell you when I was in the traditional system, although Jana hates it, call it traditional. She mm. wants to think that no. it's non-traditional actually, mm-hmm. which it kind of is. But when I was in the regular, you know, um, traditional system with the insurance model and big farm and all that, I never got patients that think me like that. Right. You know, right. Now we get it almost daily. So very rewarding. Oh yeah. No, I, I would agree. I mean, it's just, uh, I've shared some of the letters I get, uh, from, uh, patients to my staff just so I include them that they're really part of this team. It's not just myself or it's not Kylie or it's not Jennifer, but it's, it's, it's really the entire team approach. Um, you know, so I got a letter, uh, that, uh, let's see, my church here in, in Wenatchee was talking about the importance of intimacy within uh, within marriage and, you know, how important it is to be sexually active. And and so I was texting my uh, uh, pastor during that going, hormones, 
programs. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah right. Sure. We, we could talk about it uh, from a spiritual, metaphysical realm, how important it is. But if we're not, you know, I, I remind our, our patients that, you know, if we could go back 100 years when we were eating better and we were all working mm-hmm. physically, our hormones were optimal, right? We wouldn't be here talking about this. I mean, that's uh, why yeah. women had a ch- child every year for 15, mm-hmm. 20 years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that that would be why my grandmother had 15 children. Yes, <laughs> But, you know, I, I think one thing that um, we've kind of done to our women is that we've just said, well, let's just remove body parts and that's going to solve the problem. And, and then right. they get scared because, um, and, and you've probably addressed this many times, um, you know, y- you think, okay, there's no libido, there's no interest, and we know that's going to become a problem in her life at some point she's going to have to address it whether it means divorce or you know bad relationships or whatever but we have this fear um that's been put out there that women do not need testosterone have you heard that one oh oh yes uh, very oh, yes. much so <laughs> <laughs> that was a rhetorical question by the way <laughs> yes yes <laughs> Well, and, and, you know, here's here's what it, uh, I've been referring to. Uh, I, I love Dr. Bredesen out of UCLA. He's functional medicine, functional medicine neurologist. But I, I'm starting to, since I'm re-meeting up with my colleague, Melanie Dorian from uh, Virginia, she couched the term 21st century medicine because she said, try and explain functional medicine to people okay. can be really challenging. So I, I just say, okay. For example, Dr. Bredesen, UCLA, he's practicing 21st century medicine. He's going, no, women need testosterone. And here's the data to support it. And, and his work is, is brilliant. And he clearly shows that, okay, here's this sickness model reference range that we've collected on sick people coming into hospitals. But here's where females need to be. And here's where men need to be, right? Um, so, no, that's a, that's a game changer. And, and so one of the letters I recently got was from a 66-year-old woman who said, I didn't know that I could have my life back again. I didn't know that I could enjoy intimacy again at 66. And, of course, the three of us have sat around going, uh, no, God didn't suddenly say, stop, mm-hmm. thou shalt stop having sex at 50 or 49, right, or 35. Um, right. You know, continue yeah, I, I, on. What, it is... The most it puts the biggest smile on my face when I am talking to a man, and he's in his seventies, and you know we got his hormones balanced, and um, he's talking about how active his sex life is for the first time in years, and they're in their seventies, and then his wife's in the background yelling things about you're not going to stop your testosterone. (laughs) It is just, I mean, how can you not smile about things like that? And you don't get that when you give somebody a a statin for cholesterol or a blood pressure medication. You don't, you don't get that, you know? Right. Um, right. And, and that's why hormones are so rewarding. Which is yeah. one of the reasons. Yeah. And we're only talking about the, the intimacy, but there's, yeah. yeah, it's the anti-tumor necrosis factor that mm-hmm. testosterone has. It's the, Hey, natural antidepressant. It's a, it's yeah, it just a, makes you exactly. feel better. Yeah. Yeah. And then what it does for the ApoB, you know, it's like, it's just amazing. Right. And, and the bones. It, mm-hmm. There is, I, I have an ongoing challenge. If anybody can find a better drug for treating bone density than testosterone, I'm all ears. But there's not. Right. Testosterone right. is hands down the best bone building drug there is out there. Period. Yeah. No, I remember your interview with uh, Dr. Neil Rosier where uh, he was talking about absolute risk reduction for testosterone mm-hmm. for a cardiovascular event is 50% versus 2 to 3%. Which one do, should I choose, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. right. Relative it, it, and absolute risk are two different animals, aren't they? And it's, it's amazing how we kind of have just set to the side and said big pharma is better than what our body naturally makes and needs. And um, and the other place that I think um, I see in our patients is that, you know, the purpose of hormones just seem to lie in reproduction, but that's not it. I mean, that's what we're talking about, right? The different organs and the different places that it really impacts our whole body as an organism, not just one place. 
Right. Exactly. I, I always remind folks that they are truly the communicators within the system, right? Mm-hmm. And so if those communicators suddenly shut down, well, the rest of the body goes, uh, I'm not hearing what's what's going on. I mean, you guys have heard me share the story about my, uh, she just turned 85. Uh, you guys mm-hmm. know my mom. Awesome. Yeah. Your mom, you right? Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah. And my mom, you know, I, I take good care of her and she has basically threatened my life if I ever stop <laughs> treating her with hormones, you know, so <laughs> it's like, okay, mom, uh, I'll keep going because I, I love my mom. So I want to keep her around. Yeah, we, we've shared this story before, but it's not, we're sharing it again. We've got a 90-some-year-old patient, and um, um, he was telling us – he's on testosterone. He was telling us how important his sex life is, and he, he told us, he says, look, don't take me off testosterone because I'll probably start having sex, and you might as well put a bullet to my brain. He literally said that to us, and it's a reminder of how important you know that is, so – we tell patients that if you go to a doctor and they tell you that sex isn't as important as it used to be when you're over 50, over 40, or doesn't matter what number they give you, right, get, right. get a new doctor. Right. Exactly. I mean, think about all the, all the endorphins that come from that. Exactly. Yeah. That, that we don't even know. That or we, the factor we, of what? The endorphins. No. I can put up with your bullshit. Oh yeah, we interviewed this guy. This is this is funny, Carl. We're just telling a story. This is true. We were interviewing a doctor from California, and um, he specializes in hormones, and he's on the same page that you and I are. Hmm. And um, he was telling us a story, and he is just very black and white. Right. And he was telling us a story about how you know uh, one of the good things that um, having sex in a in a marriage. Um, comes from one, one thing. Good things that comes out of it is that you can. And he literally said this: <laughs> you can put up with each other's bullshit better. <laughs> hey, he didn't leave the. To- he didn't put the toilet seat down. Well, out. that's okay. We have sex, so it doesn't matter. But but, but there is something True. very positive about that because you know you think about women when we are uh, breastfeeding our babies. There's so much more that happens besides the physical act of that. And, you know, we're talking about these chemicals that are being released in our brain, these endorphins. They're super important, whether it's exercise or whether, I mean, because it brings your brain out of the negative place, right? And, Mm -hmm. and. Mm I mean, it's better, I mean, it's a better fix than any drug out there that you can even, you know, imagine. And think of what we tolerate with our children when they're small. I mean, seriously, especially as mother. And, you know, there's a big point along that, I think, in putting things in perspective in our life when these natural chemicals that we're blessed to have actually are happening. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. It just it's the whole cascading benefit that you know one gets from it. Um, so I, w- I was thinking of a question that maybe you guys could answer too. So if you go back to that WHI Women's Health Study, that of mm-hmm. course all my peers at the sickness system quote, you know, hey, you can't have my patient on X Y Z because of this, which was as we know, you and I, we've talked about how flawed it was. Um, do you remember, I think uh, prior to that WHI study, was the use of hormones, was it as high as 30% pre that study and it's dropped to as low as 10%? There's a podcast I was listening to and I, I'd love to know that statistic. I don't know those numbers, but I do know that it was a lot higher before the WHI study, which was 2002, right. that it was released. And then it just fell off the map. Yeah, it fell um, so dr- dramatically, and and I've been thinking about okay. So as cancer rates slow down, no. No. As stroke and heart attack, cardiovascular mm-hmm. disease, no. No. They've all just increased dramatically, no. yeah. right? I, and you know, even just a, a prelude to that should be this: there were some symptoms that um, will come out faster than heart attack and stroke or mm-hmm. osteoporosis or you know dementia or whatever one of those symptoms are your logical s- symptoms so immediately one of the specialists that started to see problems after that were your, your urologists 
they started mm-hmm. to see an increased risk of all kinds of urogenital problems, including urinary tract infections and um, vaginal atrophy and urinary incontinence. Because all these women, they were fine when they were on their estrogen, but now they're on their estrogen, they're having all these bladder and urogenital symptoms. And so urologists were one of the first ones to see the, the bad effects of the WHI study. And what can we take away from the WHI study? There is mm-hmm. one or two things, in my opinion, that we can take away from the WHI study. Because mm-hmm. really all that it said was um, premarin and medroxyprogesterone acetate might mm-hmm. increase the risk of cardiovascular um, problems and breast cancer. And you could even look at the, the study, and the study was not done well because of the age groups of placebo versus people in the treatment group. But either way, the thing is, is Premarin is not bioidentical estrogen. It's not estradiol. It's not estriol. It's not estrone. It does have some estrone and estradiol in it, but it's mm-hmm. also got at least 19 different estrogens in there one of them, which is equiline, which comes from a horse only. Um, right. Most of them aren't, of these estrogens aren't natural to women. So you can't compare it to estradiol. And, med- right. and, 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 and medroxyprogesterone acetate, even more so. You cannot look at medroxyprogesterone acetate like progesterone. They are completely different molecules and have completely different effects in the body. So how ignorant is it of doctors to even buy off on a study in the first place but 20 some years later we are still Mm -hmm. making women suffer the consequences of not going on hormones because of the fear of that well i i i think you know and putting in perspective what i've shared with patients is that i agree with it 100 percent permanent and prevera are horrible and they're bad and i don't think i'd ever want to use them i mean that's the only takeaway i take from that study um but Carl, you've probably seen this with your ladies and, and even for men for that matter. But what about the question that happens, um, you know, because because of the WHI, oh, if you've been through menopause so many years, we shouldn't treat you. <laughs> Have you heard that? Because I hear that almost right. every day. Right. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's um, <laughs> I think it's Dr. Flavio from Brazil who I, I uh, have met uh, a lot of the frontline critical care conferences, and, and uh, I think of his his uh, accent. You, you, you Americans are so stupid. Um, <laughs> well, I love it. yeah, right. Well, well go ahead. And, and did you did you see that, that five minute podcast I gave to you uh, from my my colleague? Um, did you get a chance to review that? I did. You said if you did send it to me, I, I guess I didn't see it. So or maybe I did. I don't know which one you're talking about. We text okay, quite so, often. So. Yeah. So you know, it's this five minute conf- uh, presentation that Melanie is doing to the HR directors and showing them. Okay, we're spending four point one trillion dollars in medical costs, and America, the United States of America, is the bottom of the barrel as far as money making producing uh, countries, as far as our healthcare, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> And so hormones play a role in that. And, and, and Janet, what was your original question as I kind of steered off? Should we the- treat women five years post-menopause? Oh, I, menopause? yeah, a- absolutely. You know, it's like whoever came up with this stop at 10, just like, you know, the, right. the so slogan with tetanus, do it again in 10. It's like, I think there's just our slogans that people come up with. There's no research to right. back it up, right? Kind of like social distancing. <laughs> Right? Seriously. Well, it, it, you know, it's really sad because I, I do have ladies that come in and they, they talk to me and, and they'll they'll say, you know, and, and my answer is, if you, he's not willing to treat you, let me give you somebody who will. Um, but it's a true thing that's out there that in our, our provider world of being so doctors pervasive. and telling people, hey, you can't do this because you're so far out there. And so, you know, I always try to dispel that for them and say, okay, well... Um, pretty sure <laughs> that you can, but um, you know, you might rethink who you're going to because you know, I feel like that's a big one. Like that's a big place that we end up. Like, oh, there's no hope for you. We can't. We can't do anything for you here. Right. Yeah, and it, again, a lot of that stems back to the WHI study. So they did show increased risk. I think it was like six tenths of one percent of clotting or stroke or heart attack using, again, the Premarin progestin right. arm, right? Um, but we're not doing those anymore. 
Right. And we're using bioidentical estradiol. And I, I kind of say it's 10 times less the potency of whatever is in that Premarin component. Mm -hmm. right? um, so if it's six tenths of 1% increased risk of starting after that 10 year window and it drops significantly. And again, that's based on some, I'm using the WHI study against them in that regard. Right. No, I get it. Yeah. Now yeah. we're doing something that is completely, it's like 10 times less. So it's near zero or zero or zero, right? Well, and let's not forget one of the most deep dating diseases to women is osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, when women, when women will say, well, my doctor wants to, says I shouldn't be on HRT anymore. Um, you know, how, so what are you thoughts about, you know, how long should I be on this? I'm like, well, ask your doctor how, if you, had, because you had osteoporosis and now you don't, at least numbers wise, because of you being on HRT, ask him how long he would put you on a medication for osteoporosis. And the answer is until they die. Mm -hmm. So wh wh why do we treat hormones any different? You know, right. I mean, seriously, I, I, I mean, it's just, it, it is like, like your colleague said, stupid Americans. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and it's, it's really giving, you know, so I get that question commonly. Okay. When do I get to go off these? And uh, I give them the informed, the negative informed consent. When you're ready to have increased risk of cardiovascular disease, stroke, yeah. cancer, bone loss, then you can stop anytime. And I always give right. folks that freedom that absolutely. You know, I'm not making them take these. This is nope. totally their choice, right? No, nope. so. and, and I always, I always add in there some of the one the symptoms that are kind of going to come back pretty fast. If if you don't want to have libido anymore, and you want to have painful intercourse, and you want to have a dry vagina, you can stop these anytime. Or urinary tract infections. Or urinary tract infections. Yeah. Urinary incontinence. Yeah. You can stop them anytime. Brain fog. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. No, it's a real hot, thing. Possibly hot flashes. Um, so, insomnia. Go ahead. So in in. The thought, if we stay in the sick care world, most of these women are going to be told at some point in time, because I feel like this is the only path we go down, is that, you know, how we're going to solve this for you is we're just going to, we're going to give you a hysterectomy. We're just cut everything out. Um, right. Yeah. That's, you know, that podcast, uh, it's uh, Peter, uh, Dr. Atia, Atia. Dr. Yeah. Peter Atia, yeah. Uh, in that podcast uh, with a couple of physicians interviews where they break down the WHI study and all of its flaws, is I, I always remind, especially my female patients, I'm going to let you listen to this, but it's going to piss you off in terms of what, <laughs> yeah. what medicine has done to females. Oh, let's surgerize this. Let's take out this. Oh, that didn't work. Let's take out the, let's take out the pituitary on, on females, right? Um, and, and so they just keep doing surgery on females. I, I, I use the same example with mammograms. If they had something like that for us men squeezing our male parts like that, it, it would have stopped years ago, right? Right. And I mean, on that same uh, topic, I mean, you know, anytime men have issues with whatever, the answer is not to cut off our testicles, I mean, no. we did do that a while for when we were barbaric treating, barbarically treating prostate cancer, which we kind of still probably do treat prostate cancer barbarically when we give men chemotherapy. But um, that's a whole other subject. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, we don't cut off men's testicles. And, I mean, Neil Rosier, one of our um, favorite guys we learned a lot of information from, Dr. Neil Rosier, who I interviewed on our podcast, when – Ignorantly, doctors associate with testosterone with heart attacks. And, of course, that's just the silliest thing we've ever heard of. But, you know, him being facetious and his facetious, you know, cynical attitude, which it's hard not to practice in stupid America and not be cynical sometimes about our healthcare system. He said, well, if testosterone is so bad for men and it creates so many problems and causes heart attacks, why don't we just cut off men's balls? And, of course, that's silly. And, right. But yet... That's what we do with women. We cut out their ovaries. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know? No, it is, it's truly maddening. And uh, what was the other thought I was going to have about that? But uh, it just uh, skipped my mind. So if there's another question. Well, there is a question. Why don't we stream Margaret's comment? One of our favorite patients just made a comment. So 
You want to read that, Janet? I thought I was falling apart with severe joint pain, mainly hip and shoulder, but once Carl put me on hormone therapy, I feel like I'm a new person. My hip is completely gone and my shoulder pain is manageable. Thank you, Carl, for all you do. Thanks, Sean and Janet, for Biogenical Hormones. Well, thank you, Margaret. Yep. We love those kind words. Thank you for watching and listening today. So in, in this discussion of what she's saying, I think she's touched on something we haven't even talked about today mm -hmm. and you probably see this um hormones play a balance in our pain tolerance and how we feel too can you want to speak to that because I, I think that gets overlooked a lot well what i describe and so no it's a beautiful uh, comment from margaret and and uh, so no thank you for that as well um it's just, you know, her comments and, and some of the other folks, uh, it just, it's what keeps us going, right? <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> oh, I know. Yes. Uh, let's go back to when we used to practice uh, in the sickness realm. We weren't getting folks saying, thank you for putting me on that drug or that yeah. stat. Never. Or, no, never. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. it was never. It was uh, so. Uh, so the, the role that hormones play. So again, um, Let's go back to 21st century medicine, functional medicine. So, you know, we're talking about gut function, gut, you know, the, you know, I always used to love what Dr. Hoey would say that uh, the, the gut is the engine that drives the system. So, you know, let's have good gut function. But the role that hormones play is the role in transport of nutrients to the joints, which then allows healing. Right, we're getting all these great nutrients, all these great uh, enzymes that we need to kind of reduce inflammation. So that's um, very common to see amongst folks saying, "Man, my hips, my shoulders," or "I'm not sleeping, but now I'm sleeping better." Well, sleep is a huge yeah. healing factor, yeah. right? I mean, sleep and what we put in our gut; those are the two primary things. And if we can get those resolved, uh, it's amazing. Now, I do have. Some uh, that will argue that, uh, well, first, let me have my patient prove that they're going to take care of their gut and they're going to exercise, uh, and then maybe we'll consider putting them on hormones. And I just have never mm. seen that work. Um, no. The patients I, I just, are always, they're already feeling bad enough. Yeah. I think hormones first. I, I agree with that. because and, uh, and then work on those other details. I, I will say this coming from the standpoint of uh, dealing with a thyroid problem in my life um you know sometimes you just have to get something rebalanced before all those other things that you're doing come together mm, so yeah, to tell absolutely. someone keep suffering until i decide <laughs> it's okay for you to have some type right? Um, right the intervention for me was night and day and i have told this story before but it was it was to a point and this is one of the reasons we seeked out um you know, the path we went um, for helping people with hormones is that, you know, I was a brand new mother, but I had babysat all my life and I had, you know, four younger siblings. And so taking care of children was not a problem. I mean, it, it wasn't, you know, I loved it. But when my children were, I think Jordan was just a newborn and my other one was a two-year-old, their behavior was normal, but my connection to it was off and I knew it. And I, I found myself crying a lot, um, wanting to avoid things, wanting to avoid people. I mean, and it wasn't until I actually got that hormone back in and balanced that, whew, now I can live, like I can be who I am, right? So to deny right. someone because you want to decide whether or not they're going to to me, it's really sad because that would be very barbaric. I mean, because I knew there was something wrong. And most of the time when people come to us, they have a sense there's something not right and I need help. And mm -hmm. um, if I had been told that, I don't, you know, I, I just find that really tragic that that's the, the, the point of, you know, you know, it's not, it's not unheard of to, you know, that the diet and exercise comes along with that person feeling better as they are improving and thinking and just, you know, that whole process just kind of, you know, right. plays it, it, a role it, together. Yeah. It keeps them in the shame um, and shame is a low energy field. Right. right? Yeah. And, and right. so really when you're treating them in conjunction with teaching and educating them, empowering and back to empowering them, right. Um, mm -hmm. By us kind of giving them, the choices and here you start this it's it's your choice it empowers them and then it's just you know like we've seen 
all the time, it's like, wow, what a role that plays. And it just escalates up quite quickly. So then they're in a you know higher energy feel of joy, contentment, love, peace, you know, to talk about energy fields, right? So right. Uh, it's, totally. that's, that's what I see so often. Um, there was a boy. There's a, all these thoughts that come as you're talking too, but uh, it'll have to come come back to me. Um, L- let me of, oh, uh, under let treating. Me, uh, here's yeah, what I see. P- yeah, piggyback on empowering is. I mean, that's our goal. Of this podcast is to educate and empower individuals to take charge of their own right. health. And I it it takes me back to a podcast when we were interviewing Dr. Sean Baker, the the author of the Carnivore Diet. Um, and he talks about in our, you know, orthopedic sur- He's an orthopedic surgeon, um, and you know, he talked about how disempowering it is in our sick care system mm-hmm. when somebody gets prescribed a- another drug for their disease. And and it is, I mean, and it's 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 depressing for them and disempowering mm-hmm. because then they're sitting there thinking, I have no control over my own life. Here's this drug company that's going to control me for the rest of my life. Think about how disempowering that is. So when we practice 21st century medicine, we try to empower patients and it does, it gives them, you know, it get, the sense of empowerment alone is an antidepressant, um, makes them feel better, makes them want to start eating better, exercising more, all that stuff. Right, right. And it just, you know, like we've seen, it just escalates and improves from there. So one of the things I, I want to address is, and you guys have seen this just because you're out there in the, uh, the larger community than I am, but just the under treatment that you see, mm-hmm. you know, cause you have folk, you have some clinicians that are uh, dabbling in what we do in terms of hormones and thyroid. And, and then I'm also learning as I kind of get out there, Oh, there's a whole nother group out there that just teaches small micro doses. So for example, progesterone. So one of my mm-hmm. colleagues from Idaho at a conference, she was like, you start progesterone at a hundred or even 200, you know, in my group and my organization, it's like maybe 25 or 50. Yeah. Right. And, and so then I tell her about Dr. Uh, so Dr. Novak from Canada, who I, I just remember at this last conference in, uh, in Texas and uh, this Canadian physician, bright, articulate, knows her data so well, says, now personally, I take 1800 milligrams of progesterone. <laughs> yeah. And my jaw is just dropping, you know, I'm going, yeah. oh, that's not a paradigm I'm comfortable with. You better explain yourself. Uh, yeah. And she did, and she did a great job. So even how uh, I have shifted my paradigm is now I'm giving giving folks, okay, I'm 200 milligrams or, you know, 100 milligrams. It depends on the situation, right? So each person is individualized. So we still do that in 21st century medicine. But now what I've done with my females is I, I say, okay, I'm going to give you this 200 milligram rapid dissolve troche that you can control what dose. So you want to do a quarter, you want to do a half, you want to do it once a day, you want to do it three times a day. And invariably they're like, oh, give me more guidance than that. You know, what am I titrating it to? And I said, well, it depends on what's going on with you. So I had one tax accountant that said, oh, my goodness, best tax accountant season ever. <laughs> right, right. You know, stressful client coming in. Mm, I'm going to slip one of those quarter. <laughs> right. And she said she just remained calm and just, you know, had the best season. Uh, I had a 23-year-old in here not too uh, long ago. I gave her kind of the same, you know, here's your nighttime one, but here's the one you get to manage during the day. And she said, my boyfriend said, I'm no longer grumpy. <laughs> I said, okay, that's, you've met that dose. That's yeah, good. Right, uh, right. So it works for controlling breast tenderness, bleeding, anxiety, depression. Uh, but it really, it's, it's empowering the patient to say, you figure out what dose. Works that's right. That's yeah. right. Because ultimately they have to be in charge of that. It's, it's right. their body. We can educate them, but ultimately they have to be in charge. And speaking of microdosing, underdosing, um, conservative dosing, whatever you want to call it, um, mm-hmm. we get the same thing with testosterone and not for, for women and for men. I mean, I see, you know, providers out there that will prescribe 7.5 milligrams of testosterone for men. And it's just like, okay. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> and, you know, as pharmacists, we have to be very careful. Right. 
between the patient and the provider because we don't you know we work with those providers and we so we we don't want to burn any bridges and we just want to be educational so we have to say well you know this person is very very conservative um maybe we can get them to up the dose a little bit or whatever and um you know and a lot of times did you say 7.5 7 yeah for a man yes absolutely oh yeah yeah. i've seen i've seen 0.025 for a woman carl yeah uh have. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's like, and, why do we? Well, why are we wasting our time? I mean, it's, it's like, a fear. I think that mm-hmm. has been taught to somebody, and they just don't understand. I mean, it's it's sad, but it's true um, because um, the the only way I can say you get there is that you've been taught um, mm-hmm. with an organization that believes that hormones aren't good for you. Otherwise, I. I mean, 0.025 yeah. is like, I, I cringe when I get, let's increase this woman's dose by 0.01. I'm like, why? <laughs> why? She's yeah. probably doing that with her cream and her syringe anyway, every other day anyway. So I don't know why we are even, but I mean, we are, we, you know, we have to be polite about it. But at the same time, you know, this underdosing thing, I, I, I'm, I'm not really exactly sure where it all comes from, but I, I see it daily. Right. Well, there's, and there's a reason why you you have me on the podcast. I mean, I'm probably one of your number one prescribers, right? Um, And it's because I have such an incredible high success rate. You know, folks keep coming back because they feel good. That's why we refer patients to you because we know they're going to feel better quicker. Right. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, uh, so testosterone, you know, the the best way to explain that, and, and, and again, there's, so much data and so much mythology about testosterone, right? It goes back a hundred years to, uh, uh, is it Morgan Teller or Morgan? I can't remember the, uh, the urologist that, you know, did that. I think it's that Morgan Thal. Morgan Thal. Okay. Yeah. Did that study. Um, and so the best way, and what I explained to my patients, it's the saturation model of testosterone. You can't overdo it. It's like watering a plant. The difference is what happens inside of our bodies is it gets, transferred or gets uh, converted to estradiol and do you remember when i mean go back 10 years we used to fear what estradiol would do to us mm-hmm. men oh and there, oh. there's still right. doctors that do that and they prescribe and estrogen blockers for, for men all the time and it makes jan and i just cringe yeah well and that's and, and that's where again i, I look at the, what bredesen has done in the 21st century medicine practice is he challenged that estradiol mythology because if you look at some of the labs it says thou shalt keep estradiol between 7.6 and 42.6 and don't ask what happens below it or what happens over it just don't ask any questions we're just and and don't don't care what the person's estradiol was before they even used testosterone because it could have been 75 or 100 right right exactly (laughs) i mean seriously Right. And so now, you know, what uh, Bredesen and, and many others are leading the way with these uh, perspective studies on estradiol is, wow, look, it uh, actually helps provide cardiovascular protection, bone protection, brain protection, and prostate. Um, so I'm going to tell you my estradiol level, I just got it back because 150. Yeah. I, oh, right. I, I, man, Carl, we got to do something right now. Not, not, not yesterday. Right now, we got to do it right now. <laughs> right now. So uh, I can tell you, uh, I am not confused who I am. I'm not wearing bras. Um, I'm doing great. Um, <laughs> and and my prostate numbers are, by the way, they're shrinking too. The PSA. It um, it's amazing. It's it amazing. Is. And yeah. then you know what I love about his studies too is showing that hey, estradiol prevents the amyloid plaque from crossing the blood brain barrier gumming up the brain isn't that cool yeah wow we we may actually have less dementia moving into the future yeah of course that's not good for big pharma because they they're studying dementia hard so they can try to find another drug for it which they've shown that those drugs aren't even effective but yet we keep prescribing them unbelievable not really (laughs) So, Carl, as we wind this podcast up, I got to ask you, what do you have a passion for? Oh, what I, you know, I, I really have a passion for, uh, I just have taken on the passion of just staying healthy. I love working out. Um, I've got my gym in my garage now. And uh, since I, 
you know, since I did that multifunction cardiogram, which I talked about several podcasts ago and, and showed that, wow, I got some issues going on. Man, I love doing weights. I love, you know, getting on my Peloton bike. Um, yeah, I'm not a cyclist like you are, a mountain bike rider, but, you know, I really love staying in shape. So at 60, Sean, I'm feeling great. Lots of energy doing circles around most 60 year olds. I know. I love it. And I will tell you, it is very rewarding to see results from, you know, working out and just how strength training or cardiovascular endurance training can just help benefit your overall body and well being. Um, I say it all the time there is no better antidepressant than exercise, period. Period. If you if you are depressed, go exercise. I don't guarantee many things, but I almost guarantee you will not as be as depressed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it helps uh, resolve anxiety for me. And the other passion I have is uh, I, I uh, having a grandbaby in November, and I can't wait. I am so excited. Oh my gosh, that's news to me. Wow, I thought we were friends, Carl. You didn't tell me. <laughs> yeah. No, my uh, son and his wife that live in Park City, Utah. Said they're having a baby in November, and uh, man, I can't wait. That is awesome. That is awesome. So, Carl, as we wind this podcast up, tell our listeners and viewers, if they have any questions, what's the best way to get a hold of you? So the best way to get a hold of me is uh, the area code is 509-888-6334. It's been the same number, Sean, for almost, I'm going almost 20 years. Wow. Good for you. Good for you. Yeah. Well, Carl, thank you for being on our podcast today and helping us realize our goal, which is to educate and empower individuals to take charge of their own health. So thank you so much for all you do, Carl. Absolutely. My pleasure. Good to see you as always. Yep. And listeners and viewers, thank you for tuning in to Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. Tune in Thursday for our midweek podcast, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. Thank you.